Okay. Uh, you know, there was so much to discuss that it's, it's necessary to break these up a little bit. So this session is going a little bit longer than the other ones. And I want to make sure I get as much content out to you as possible. So uh, we did break these up. So I'm going to keep moving forward. I left off on the last ses uh, session with the six inch rule. And now we're working our way into the six wire rule. What is the six wire rule? No more than six wires should be repaired in a bundle. And let's take a look at what happens when we have damage that is, say, in one particular area, which is usually always the case, right? It's the, the it's not very kind to us uh, most of the time when there is damage that they're, they're staggered for us. So when we start to do that repair, we end up with a pile of splices in one area. Right? They start stacking up on each other. What we call is the meatball effect. You get a big meatball in the wire harness assembly. What that does, it creates a lot of EMF, right? A big electromagnetic field around that bundle. Now, when they design the architecture of the electrical system, they realize that they're going to be passing current through this wire, and it's going to create an EMF. But they didn't calculate for one, two, three, four, five, six times the amount of EMF that they have calculated for. So you start running into a lot of interference. We had a customer that was complaining about buzzing and humming in their stereo system. That was the result of splices that were stacked up on top of each other. And as they started passing or loading down their electrical system, right, turn on the radio, put on the wipers, hit the rear defrost, that current flow through those wires started radiating itself onto the ground side of these wire leads. And that got picked up through the speakers in their car, that buzzing, that and humming that you see when you get static buildup. So what's the alternative to something like this or the six inch rule? Well, let me give you an idea. Let's go back to the six inch rule very quickly. On the six inch rule, we're telling you no repairs within six inches of a termination point, right? So this is our termination point up here, and this is clearly not six inches. So what do we do? We provide you with the wire you need to run or extend your circuit, right? So in this case, we provided this particular customer, or for this practice or example, a longer wire lead and spliced it further beyond the six inches that's required or necessary. And if Katie can zoom in on this, I want to also demonstrate something to you. This is a twisted pair of wires. I repaired it. I repaired a twisted pair. And using this mini splice, if you can see it in here, I was able to maintain the twist. So this is pretty effective. This is going to last a while. Uh, in addition, I get, I'm giving you an idea of what some of the automotive splices would look like. And if you tried to do that, use this particular type of splice in this repair, you would end up with your something that doesn't look too desirable, and you would end up with a larger EMF on here. I know it's twisted, but you're still going to run into a little bit of an issue. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about splices in a minute. So yes, extend it. Tell us what you need. We're here to assist you. If, I, if you tell me, hey, I need 12 inches of this wire lead, we're going to provide you to 12 inches. If you tell me I need a gray and 18 gauge, I'm going to get your gray with 18 gauge. If you're telling me I need to terminate and the terminal looks like this, guess what we're going to provide you? That wire lead with that terminal on it. So, again, let's take advantage of some of the opportunities we have in the field uh, and give us an opportunity to show you what we can do. Uh, so, again, six inch rule. What do we do? On the six wire rule, when we have a bundle or stack like this, we stagger. Again, kind of seeing if Katie can zoom in or we're still zoomed in, not too sure. But look at the stagger compared to the bundle, right? And again, uh, the use of mini splices really helps. Once this gets closed up, it's going to be a little bit difficult to determine whether it's been repaired or not. Cosmetically, it's going to look great. Uh, as far as a repair goes, even better, even better than that. So let's remember, stagger, and look at, we could always provide you the wire leads necessary 
to make that stagger and that's really everything okay so six inch rule six wire rule uh, let's talk a little bit about connector damage because we see a lot of it <clears throat> and we have a lot of them so uh, let me give you an idea of what that would look like and I wanted to just show you a connector that's damaged. Uh, I had already started swapping the wires over into the replacement housing. And I want to just give you an idea of how that would uh, look in uh, real world time, right? So <clears throat> I have a damaged connector housing. I'm going to swap it over. I removed the damaged secondary lock. And I go in and I extract the terminal lead. damage pretty good pull it out of the housing and swap it over into my replacement right remove replace remove and replace going in order and the connectors are numbered pin one two three and if not uh, there is a diagram online that does show pin position orientation for your particular connector housings one thing I want to point out about this housing when I went to swap it is the backside. As I was swapping these wire leads one by one, my fourth cavity had a plug in it. These plugs are just as essential as these wire leads. You need to be able to remove it and replace it back into the new housing. Otherwise, you have an open cavity and you're going to get all kinds of moisture in there and it's going to lead to all types of corrosion and it's going to be a problem so just remember swap over the cavities if you need cavities let us know we can provide you cavity plugs that's what we're here for okay so connector removal and replacement let's take a another look at some other things that we could do in the field and we talked about let's recap quickly we talked about different types of wire damage right we were talking about uh external heat sources, internal heat sources like electrical overload. Uh, we talked about rodent damage. Uh, we talked about wire damage and what can be repaired and what can't. The six inch rule, the six wire rule. We talked about replacement. How do we go about keeping that item on the car so that it can continue in service? Well, I want to go a little bit further now and go look at these individual terminal housings, these little terminals, excuse me. Because a lot of times what happens is the, the connector gets ripped off of the wire bundle, bam, it takes the terminal with it. And really all we're thinking about then at that point is what do I need to do to replace the terminal? Well, in order to do that, one, you need the terminal. And then secondly, you need the tooling. So I want to give you a quick demonstration of using the correct tooling for the right job. And then I want to show you what kind of really happens in the field. So I have this terminal that I'm going to crimp a uh, wire lead on, and I'm going to grab my wire lead. And I'm going to prep it a little bit. Okay, it's already been blunt cut for me, which is good. And I'm going to take it down a little bit. How far did I, how did I know how far to strip that? How am I going to know? how much crimp height I need here. Because remember previous sessions, we talked about the essential uh, or the need for the correct crimp height. I know that because the manufacturer provided me the specifications. The manufacturer told me what my strip length should be on the wire. It's telling me what my crimp height should be. It's telling me what my tolerance is. And it gives me, again, a reminder of what the terminal is supposed to be, part number. So I went and I referenced the original equipment manufacturer specification for this type of terminal. When I did that, it also told me that I need this tool to do it. So I'm going to grab the tool that they recommended. I'll open up the jaws. I'll stick my terminal in place. And I'll slowly bring it down into position. You can hear it clicking. And I want to just hold it there. While I have it in place, I'm going to take my wire lead and I'm going to feed it into the terminal and I'm going to crimp it and release.
terminal. Next test, micrometer. Now I know you're not going to do this in the field, so we're going to kind of show you what we can do to help compensate for that. But I'm going to check my crimp height. I'm going to see just how far the jaws went and what type of termination I received. And my crimp height is 1.23 millimeters. And according to the spec sheet, I need to be at 1.24 plus or minus 0 0.05. Well worth in, within tolerance. That also tells me that this is correctly calibrated. So I'll get a good crimp every time. But you can't be out there in the field pulling up spec sheets every time you need to terminate a terminal. Uh, that's our job. That's what we do. So what do you do in the field? Well, the best tool that's available to you for that, outside of an OEM application, obviously, but that's a lot of different applications, is a B crimper. Call it a B because it rounds the terminal over and gives you that nice conductor crimp that you're looking for. A couple of different sizes here to choose from, depending on the terminal height. But this is practice. After I've done a couple of these, and then I turn and I use this, and I'm saying, hey, in this position, I'm getting 1.24 millimeters crimp height. I'm going to use this B indent every time I use this type of terminal. So there are ways that you can, again, either document it yourself or just remember as a good rule of thumb that when I'm working this particular type of connector, I have to start considering using position B on my terminal crimps, and that will help a lot. So again, tooling-wise, you're looking at cutters with a needle nose on it, strippers that can get you down to 26 gauge because we're dealing with a lot of small wire, B crimper, your inspection tool, factory crimps when necessary, and uh, applicable, right? Whenever you can use one, highly recommend doing it. And then a nice pick set so you can get in and out and in and out of these connector housings. One more thing I want to show you, and that's regarding splicing. And we're going to do much more of this tomorrow when we look at the Telsonic, uh, which is a great tool for sonic welding. And we're going to have a demonstration from one of our technicians on the usage of the Telsonic. So I want to go back a little bit, and I want to take a look at some wires. So I'm just going to grab some here for the sake of demonstration. I'm going to grab this. I'm going to cut off my terminal because I don't need that anymore. That was my last demo. Put that to the side. All right, so now I have a wire lead exposed, blunt cut for myself. I want to strip this down in order for me to crimp one of these automotive style splices how far do i know to strip this back in order for me to get the amount of conductor retention i need inside here i really don't know uh, the oem didn't specify the company that provides these didn't specify this is a really hit and miss butt splice so i'm going to hit and miss on this thing and i'm going to show you uh, some of the different ramifications of hitting and missing so I'm going to, because of experience, that's the best way I can describe it, I'm going to take it down, maybe about a quarter of an inch, and I'm going to slide it into the barrel. Again, how do I know I have enough area or retention in there when I go to crimp it? I really don't. There's no inspection hole on here. I, I can't see through there. I'm going to open my jaws, and again, my actions probably speak louder than words, I'm going to blindly crimp this onto, the split, onto that wire. A couple of things are going on here. One, I just created a lot of stress on this uh, weatherproofing. I'm going to shrink this down now, give you an idea of what that's going to look like. As I crimped, I needed to, one, force my way through the insul uh, the weather proofing and into the barrel, I ran a very high risk of compromising the insulation. I could have easily have cut it open as I was crimping that material. Uh, not a good position to be in. Uh, again, if I'm only going to really, I, when I'm on the car, get one shot at that, and I want to make sure it's right, I won't know. 
And again, I'm not too sure whether the wire I have in there or not penetrated enough and I have enough conductive material on the barrel. What's the alternative? Let's think micro. All right, let's go with smaller splices. I'm going to do a quick demo on that. And this is going to be kind of tight. I don't know if Katie's going to be able to zoom in on this one, but we'll give it a shot. All right. Okay, so let's see. Are we looking good, Katie? Mm -hmm. Pretty close? Yep, pretty close. All right, so this is my barrel, and this is my wire. Some obvious advantages here. I have an inspection hole. I can also get an idea of how much I need to strip back in order to meet that inspection hole. Big bonus. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to strip it back. Again, a little experience, eyeballing it a little bit. Now I get the opportunity to test it. I'm going to slide it in there. Oh, I'm a little short. So I'm going to take a little bit more off. Good to know. So I'm going to take a little bit more off. Again, less is more, right? The old rule, measure twice, cut once. So I measure twice, and now I have great. Now I I'm definitely can see my conductor. I know that I'm at the edge of the barrel, and now I can use my B crimper, which I'm also using for my terminals, to put a dimple in that for myself. And crimp it down. Very good. Now, again, inspection hole, still looking good. Nice crimp. I'm going to slide my barrel over. And I'm going to heat shrink again. <clears throat> now, again, I'm doing this on the bench. Very convenient, right? It's right here for me. I'm rotating it like it's on a rotisserie. Again, if you're on the car, you're pretty much doing this using a butane type of heater. All right. You can use electric if the shop will let you get in there and borrow some of their AC. And voila. Look at the difference here. Highly recommend this type of splice. Highly recommend it. Again, self-sealing. Good uh, pull strength on it. So butt splices. One thing to keep in mind before we close out this session and again, we're going to be really hot and heavy on splices tomorrow. Please don't solder. Solder is old stuff. Uh, and what happens with solder, it creates uh, a, uh, it, it forms and creates an, uh, a portion that is rigid. So as the wire begins to vibrate and shake, there's a propensity for it to crack, right? Break off. Again, just wear, tear, vibration. Kind of takes care of a spliced joint. Um, we're going to show you what we do here when we remanufacture an assembly or build one from scratch, build one new. Uh, to recap, uh, we talked about wire damage. We talked about wire restrictions. We talked about connector and terminal replacement. We took a look at the tools available to us in the marketplace, how we can go about inspecting our work, uh, how we go about testing our work. And now we'll move forward on a little bit deeper look tomorrow. Uh, or I'm sorry, on Friday, uh, as to what we can do to help build in more quality. Again, thank you for tuning in. It's really good to see everybody. Thank you for your patience, and we'll see you in the next session.